Okay, here we go. Welcome to Reign of Blood, the true story of the epic clash between the Aztec and Spanish empires. My name is Peter Mayado, and many of you heard episode zero, the trailer, and have come back for more, so thank you. For those who haven't, it's not necessary. You'll be able to follow along with our narrative just fine. But I encourage you to give it a listen first, especially if you're not at all familiar with this very important chapter in history because it provides the historical context of this clash of civilizations as it looks from our vantage point 500 years later. I also talk a little bit about who I am and why I've chosen to tell this story and what my goals and motivations are. I also want to encourage you all to follow along the website that will accompany this podcast at www.intellectualbrutality.com. I'll be posting maps and photos and links and information about our sources and all of that to supplement each episode, and we'll be developing that site along the way as well. And so, without further ado, here is episode one of Reign of Blood, the new world on the eve of Armageddon. One of the hardest parts about telling a story that's as complex and multifaceted and loaded with controversy as this one is, is figuring out where to start. For one thing, wherever you choose to start a story invariably locks you into a particular point of view. And when you have a story that changes dramatically depending on what point of view you choose, not just in its tone and its tenor, but in its substance and even in its conclusions, you have to tread very carefully. There is a Spanish version of this story, of course, and that's the story most of you have heard. The story of how a couple hundred conquistadors and their horses and their guns defeated the mighty Aztec armies and then went on to conquer much of what they called the New World. As you'd imagine, that story is laced with triumph and pride and more than a whiff of inevitability from where we sit in the 21st century. But there's also an Aztec story, and that's a story that has gone long untold. It's not a different story necessarily. In all the ways that really matter at the end of the day, it meshes or at least overlaps with the Spanish story. But the tone of that story is very different, as is the outcome. It is a tragedy in every sense of the word, one laced with sorrow and even shame, and it ends only in crushing defeat followed by attempts to erase them from memory. But one of the things that makes this story so unique is that we have a third perspective to consider, and that's the perspective of the children of the Spanish and the Aztecs, both literal and metaphorical. If you listened to episode zero, you'll recall the story we opened with about the monument in the Plaza of the Three Cultures in Mexico City. It's the small monument dedicated to the place where the final surrender of the last Aztec emperor, Cuauhtémoc, to Hernán Cortés took place. And to me, the quote on that monument captures the spirit of the story perfectly. It was neither a victory nor a defeat, but the painful birth of Mexico and all mestizo people. This is the story we're going to try to tell. The story of this painful birth of modern Latin America and the Latin American people. This is a story that a child, born of a victorious father and a vanquished mother, might attempt to tell in a way that validates and celebrates their existence without minimizing the violent nature of their conception or ignoring the failures and shortcomings of either of their parents. In order to tell that story as best we can, we have to set the table and try to paint the world as it existed on the eve of this monumental chapter in human history. And so we're going to spend the first three episodes of this podcast fairly meticulously placing all of the pieces on the chessboard, as it were. And then in episode four, we'll unleash the linear chronology of events as they unfolded. This first episode then will serve as a kind of general survey of Mexico and cover all of the major civilizations that are present in 1500. Not just the Aztecs, who may have been the most powerful civilization in the region, but they weren't alone not by a long shot. First, though, it's time for everybody's favorite part of a history podcast, the disclaimers. I need to issue a few about terminology, nomenclature, and language, so bear with me for a minute. Disclaimer number one, 
while we will attempt to tell this story holistically and from all relevant sides, there's almost no way to avoid leaning on the Spanish sources for much of the narrative, especially when we get into the chronological sequence of events and the many times the Spanish invaders engage with Mexican chiefs and cities and armies from all of these different civilizations. The first-person accounts and records we have are almost entirely exclusively Spanish, mostly because Aztec written records were destroyed in the years after their defeat. I'm going to cover the source material in a sidebar mini-episode between episodes 2 and 3, but for now just know that the Spanish side of the story is pretty much all that's left, historically speaking. Archaeology, over the last 75 years especially, has helped historians stitch together a better picture of the Aztec world than we've previously had, but it's still far from complete. It's a bit like crash investigators reassembling the wreckage of an airplane to determine the cause. It's painstaking and rarely definitive, but if you find enough pieces, you can paint a picture that allows you to speculate and draw some conclusions. And so as much as I would love for this to be a 50-50 story, you know, here's what the Spanish say happened, but here's what the Aztecs said, we just can't do that for most of the story. It will be 70-30 at best, but probably 80-20 in most cases. Disclaimer number two. The original sources, as well as the place and character names in this story, are all in Spanish or Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, and to a lesser degree in Mayan. I don't speak Nahuatl and have only a functional fluency in Spanish, which is why we're doing this podcast in English. My Spanish accent, while not authentic, isn't bad. And Spanish, of course, is one of the great languages of the world, and translations and pronunciations are pretty straightforward so I don't anticipate too many problems there. Nahuatl, however, is a different story entirely. We are very fortunate that Nahuatl is a living language today, as is Mayan and a handful of other languages that have endured into the modern era, and they continue to be first languages for small groups of indigenous people across Mexico and Central America today. There's also been a scholarly revival of Nahuatl recently, with more and more people learning it as a second language, mostly for academic or archaeological purposes. So we know a lot about the languages and have a good handle on how the names of the gods and the cities and many of the characters in this story were pronounced. Ironically, we have Spanish priests to thank for Nahuatl surviving, and we'll get into that during that first mini sidebar episode. All that said, Nahuatl is an extremely difficult language. It has diphthongs and syntaxes and other characteristics that are completely unfamiliar to most speakers of the major European languages. And so I'm going to do my best to pronounce these names and places as correctly as I can, but apologies in advance for butchering them if or more likely when I do. There are also some cases where the pronunciations and even the spellings of names and places are contested or have evolved over the years. When I was a kid, for example, the most common pronunciation of the Aztec emperor that was in power when the Spanish invaded was Montezuma, with an N. Later we learned that Moctezuma, with a C, was the more correct way to pronounce it, and that's still the most widely used version today. But scholars at some point determined that Motecuzoma was probably much closer to the way the Aztecs would have pronounced it, And over the last 25 years or so, that version has become the most widely accepted, especially in academic circles. So we'll point those kinds of things out as we go. Okay, disclaimer number three. There are some terms and phrases I'm going to use that are clearly incomplete or biased and might even be offensive to some. I'm going to try my best not to use those terms, but for reasons of both clarity and simplicity and just sheer force of habit, they're going to sneak in here and there. The biggest and most obvious one is that I'm almost certainly going to use the shorthand the conquest to refer to this period. In fact, I may have used it already. I know that term is unfair and even a little lazy. We opened this podcast going to great lengths to explain how important it is not to look at this chapter in history as a victory or a defeat. And we want to honor that spirit and be as inclusive and sensitive as we can to all sides of this story. And so I'm going to do my best not to use this term and others like it. But if I do, know that I mean no disrespect. 
This phrase, kind of like Columbus discovering America, air quotes, is just so ingrained in the literature and in popular culture. And it sticks around because there are contexts in which it's just the clearest and easiest way to refer to something in a way that everyone knows what you're talking about. Also, let's be clear, calling this a conquest isn't exactly inaccurate. As much as we want to reinforce this idea that this was a clash between two great civilizations, this was not, at the end of the day, a peaceful merger of two cultures. This was as violent an episode as anything in history. And the ensuing period of colonization and conversion, and many would say genocide, of the Aztecs and the other native peoples across Mexico, was not one of Western civilization's proudest endeavors, to put it mildly. And so there's little use pretending like it wasn't violent and turbulent and that it wasn't initiated by one side who ended up winning by calling it something else. There really is no other term that's in use that has any kind of acceptance by historians or archaeologists or academics. And I don't want to pick some overly PC term to replace it unilaterally because that may be confusing in its own right. But we'll try not to use it unless absolutely necessary. Okay, last disclaimer, which is more of an explainer and a clarification about one very important term, the word Aztec. Who were the Aztecs exactly? Many of you, I'm sure, have been shouting into your device that the word Aztec is a modern Western construct covering many different people who never called themselves Aztecs, but instead had their own names, and you should be using those names instead. Yes, yes, all that's true. The people we call the Aztecs were really a few different groups, or tribes, or ethnicities. Clans might also be a good word here. And yes, the term Aztec would not have been one that they used or even recognized. These different groups considered themselves to be distinct from each other, and many of them were enemies at one point, some of them mortal enemies even. So yes, the word Aztec doesn't really capture all of this diversity and complexity and is in many ways insufficient when we get down into the details of this story. But we can group them together for a few different reasons. They were all from the same genetic stock, and so they were the same race. They all spoke Nahuatl, which is always a huge deal to historians and lends itself to classifying people a certain way. These Aztec people also shared a common artistic and aesthetic tradition, if we can call it that, where the cities and the statues and the temples and the way they dressed were all very similar and related. These different groups were all integrated into the same economy by the time the Spanish arrived, and they shared common institutions of trade and labor and agriculture and law enforcement and all the things that make an economy work. They also shared a common caste system that was very rigid, meaning you couldn't move out of your caste, at least not very easily. And, maybe most importantly, they had a common religion, or at least a common pantheon. There were many gods in the Aztec world, in fact, and each of these groups had a god or maybe two gods that they elevated above the others. While the next city over, it might be two different gods that were more important. But they were all from the same pantheon, and they were all related and featured in the same myths and legends and prophecies, many of which were inherited from older civilizations that we'll get into in a minute. Also crucial, they all had the same practices and rituals and institutions in place to worship these gods, the most famous and important of which was, of course, human sacrifice. This is a controversial topic to state the obvious, and we'll take a deep dive into this in a second sidebar episode sometime down the road. What's important to know at this point is that human sacrifice was central to all of these groups, and the practical need for humans to sacrifice made relations between the different city-states and ethnicities, what's the word I'm looking for, complicated? You couldn't sacrifice your own population, obviously, at least not indefinitely. And so one of the motivating factors for going to war was to capture prisoners to be sacrificed which helps explain why the Aztecs had so many enemies that were eager to ally with the Spanish when they arrived, but we'll table this for now. The point here is that these different Nahuatl-speaking groups had a lot in common, but there is a line of thinking out there that lumping all of these groups together into one group is a kind of Eurocentric bigotry where Western historians minimize the complexities of pre-Columbian societies, or perhaps they're just lazy and don't care that they're trivializing them, 
While there may be some of that for sure, it's also just a very common thing that historians do all the time for totally dispassionate reasons. Look at ancient Greece, for example. We can look back now and clearly see one common civilization with the same language and the same pantheon of gods and an integrated economy from Thessaly in the north to the Peloponnesus in the south and all the islands of the Aegean between mainland Greece and Turkey and call that ancient Greece. We can zoom out a bit more and include Crete and Macedonia and up the Dardanelles and out to Rhodes and then go a bit further west to Italy and Sicily where the Greek traders set up colonies and call that the Hellenic world. All of that makes perfect sense to us now. But at the time, each of the city-states would not have considered the peoples of other city-states as brothers or even cousins that were members of one common civilization. They were Athenians or Thessalonians or Corinthians or Lacedaemonians, otherwise known as Spartans. And their loyalties lay almost exclusively with their city-state and the surrounding region it controlled. But the idea of Greece as a single unifying entity, let alone a nation, was completely foreign to them. Athenians and Spartans considered themselves to be as different as the Spanish and the French do today. Ancient Greece is going to come up a lot in this podcast because it's a good comparison in a lot of ways as we try to illuminate the intricacies of Aztec society. The point I want to emphasize here, though, is that when we say Aztecs, we mean it the way we mean ancient Greeks meaning we're talking collectively about maybe four or five distinct groups that were each a little different and had their own city-states, what the Aztecs called Altepets. And each city-state or Altepet had their own primary gods and their own nobility and all that, but they shared a common civilization that would come to dominate the central Mexican highlands in and around the Valley of Mexico beginning around 1000 A.D., That's about the time the first of these Nahuatl-speaking groups began migrating out of a place they called Aslan, which is where the word Aztec comes from, and into the fertile valley of Mexico and points south and east. Today, it's more fashionable in Spanish-language academic circles especially to call these people Nahualtec or Nahualteca, and that's probably more accurate and culturally differential. Archaeologists and anthropologists have kind of hedged a bit, They look at Aztec civilization as having continued after the conquest, which of course it did, though in a modified, Christianized, Hispanicized form all the way into our time, as have the civilizations of the Mayans and the Huastecs and the Zapotecs and the Otomi and many other groups who are still around in one form or another to this day. And they all existed before the Spanish arrived, obviously, and so academics like to divide the study of their language and their culture and their history into these two periods, before and after the conquest. Among these Nahuatl speakers from Aslan, they used the shorthand Aztec when referring to them before and during their wars with Cortes, and Nahualteca when referring to them after and up into the present day. I point this out to highlight both how difficult it can be to capture and classify groups of people, but also how many different ways people have tried to do it. And none of them are perfect for all situations. All that said, we're going to use the word Aztec or Aztec peoples when we're referring collectively to this group when it makes sense to do so because that's the name you all know. And by the time this episode's over, when I say Aztecs, you'll know exactly who we mean and who we don't mean. There will be lots of names of individuals and groups and cities and alliances that will be necessarily complex and multi-layered and even confusing and contradictory. So when we get a chance to keep things simple and clear, we'll take it. There are lots of theories about where Aslan, this mythical homeland of the Aztecs, might be. It's important to note that only the Aztecs themselves refer to this place and really only the later Aztecs who arrived towards the end of this migration period. Tradition says it's somewhere to the north of Mexico City, which if you look at a map leaves a lot of possibilities, and no one knows exactly how far north. Could have been a few dozen miles, could have been a couple hundred miles. Some believe it could have been as far north as the American states of New Mexico and Colorado because of linguistic links between Nahuatl and many of the languages spoken by Native Americans in the southwestern United States today, though those links are very, very distant. The most likely explanation for this link is that there were speakers of a much older proto-Nahuatl language in north-central Mexico who split many centuries earlier, with some going north and some going south, and their languages each evolved independently. 
In any event, it seems unlikely to me that Aslan was as far north as the modern southwest United States for any number of reasons. Apologies to my Chicano listeners out there. I know that's a very popular and poetic theory, but there's just very little evidence to support it. And the distance alone, a thousand miles or more, seems prohibitively far for a group to have migrated, especially since much of that area is desert and very mountainous. It's also quite possible that Aslan doesn't exist, and that this origin story was entirely made up by the Aztecs. They wouldn't be the first people to glorify or mythologize their origins. No one has ever found the Garden of Eden in the Bible, for example. But archaeologists are fairly certain that Nahua-speaking nomads came from north-central Mexico and migrated south as early as 400 AD, with some of those early groups making it all the way to Central America. There's a group of indigenous clans in El Salvador today that still speak a Nahuatl dialect, and it's likely that they're descendants of the Pipil group of Nahuatl speakers who were among these early groups to leave the homeland, wherever it was. But the waves of migrations we're talking about began sometime later, after 900 AD. These waves were similar to the waves of Germanic tribes that migrated into the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, first the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and later the Vandals and the Lombards and so on. All Germanic loosely, but still very different. In Mexico, these nomads had names like the Tepanex and the Acolhua and the Culhua and the Xochimilca and the Chalca. These people were considered very warlike and unrefined by the civilized people that were living in the Valley of Mexico when they arrived. Again, not unlike the way the Romans looked at the German tribes. These Nahuatl-speaking migrants arrived into a region that looked completely different than it does now. The Valley of Mexico today is entirely blanketed by the sprawl of modern-day Mexico City. But for most of history, up to and including the time of the Spanish invasion and for many years thereafter, the majority of the valley was covered by lakes. Five interconnected lakes, to be exact, fed by a combination of springs and seasonal rains. There was some snowmelt from nearby volcanoes, but not a whole lot and the small rivers and creeks that emptied into the lake ran dry much of the year. Taken together, the total surface area of these lakes was quite large, about the size of the entire San Francisco Bay Area, a little larger in fact. Lake Geneva on the French-Swiss border is another good approximation. Looking at either of those regions on a map will give you a good sense of the size and the scope of the landscape we're talking about. I've also included a map of the Valley of Mexico in 1500 AD in the episode's blog post at intellectualbrutality.com. The lakes were a good size surface-wise, but they weren't very deep on average and were as shallow as 10 to 15 feet in many places. After the rainy season, the lakes would swell together and turn into one big lake, and after a period of dry months, they might separate again. The southernmost lakes of this system were Lake Chalco and Lake Xochimilco, and they were fed by the most consistent sources of fresh water, including the snowmelt from the two highest mountains in the southeastern corner of the valley, the twin volcanoes Popocatepet and Istak Sihuat. First couple of mouthfuls of Nahuatl for you right there. The two southern lakes were also slightly higher in elevation than the larger Lake Texcoco and the others to the north. And when we say higher elevation, we're only talking a few feet maybe but it was enough to affect the whole ecosystem of the region. And so you had this cycle where the water in the southern lakes remained mostly fresh and could be used for agriculture and drinking and anything else. And that fresh water would slowly flow north into the larger lakes and would mix with the saltier water that was left over after evaporation cycles. And because at that point it had nowhere to go, the salinity would rise over time and large parts of the lake system to the east and to the north would grow saltier and much more marshy and stagnant and not suitable for farming or drinking. But they did have lots of fish and turtles and insects would breed there and there were lots of snakes and frogs and other critters that the inhabitants over time learned to turn into food and fertilizer and everything else that was useful. The Aztec name for the Valley of Mexico was Anahuac. And when they arrived after 900 AD, there were people already living there in cities that were well established. Archaeologists have found evidence of human settlement in the Valley of Mexico going back to 2500 BC. Small cities pop up periodically over the centuries. Sometimes these cities were at the heart of a larger civilization, as was the case during the time of the Aztecs. Sometimes they were backwaters on the periphery of civilizations based outside of the Valley of Mexico, 
the magnificent city the Aztecs called Teotihuacan, for example, just outside the Valley of Mexico, about 25 miles to the north of downtown Mexico City as the crow flies, was the center of a vast civilization dominating the region from 200 AD to about 700 AD. And the people living in the Valley of Mexico were part of their empire during this stretch. The ruins of Teotihuacan are some of the most visited sites across all of Mexico, and for good reason. The city is home to the largest pyramids anywhere outside of Egypt. The Pyramid of the Sun at the center of the city is about the same size at its base as the Great Pyramids of Giza, in fact. Its pitch is much shallower, though, so it doesn't rise as high. But on the flip side, you can climb it all the way to the top. Walking through the city gives you a palpable sense of the greatness of this civilization, just as walking through the ruins of ancient Rome do. It should be on everybody's bucket list. Teotihuacan was so powerful at its peak that even the Mayans, hundreds of miles away, actively traded with them, and we know that they worshipped many of the same gods, though it's not clear to me anyway who influenced who more. We know, for example, that the god the Mayans called Kulkulkan was worshipped at Teotihuacan, the third largest pyramid in the city was dedicated to him, in fact. But it's unclear which civilization worshipped him first, at least as far as I can tell. One of them adopted him from the other. That much we do know. This same god would be an important deity in the later Aztec civilization, but under a different name, one you may be more familiar with. Quetzalcoatl, literally the feathered serpent in Nahuatl. Much more on Quetzalcoatl later in the story. Sometime between 550 A.D. and 750 A.D., or maybe gradually over those two centuries, the great city of Teotihuacan completely empties out, and the whole region enters a Dark Age. The Valley of Mexico remained populated through this Dark Age, but there doesn't seem to have been a unifying civilization there until around 900 A.D., when a people the Aztecs called the Toltecs rose to become the dominant culture of the region. Toltec civilization was centered on the city of Tula, or Toyan is another spelling, about 50 miles to the north of the center of the lake region, maybe 40 miles northwest of Teotihuacan. There are some fantastic ruins at Tula as well. We don't know a whole lot about the Toltecs because there are no written records that survive from the period they are said to have been in power, and what we do know comes almost entirely from Aztec oral tradition, which was developed much later. They refer to the Toltecs and their exploits in almost mythic terms, so mythic in fact that archaeologists have had a hard time matching the oral tradition to the archaeological record. Their artistic and architectural style was distinct from the earlier Teotihuacan civilization and the later Aztec-dominated era. The Aztecs modeled many of their artistic and aesthetic styles on the Toltecs, but never quite matched their quality. Toltec works of art are considered much more refined and sublime than the later rougher Aztec interpretations. In fact, the word Tolteca in the Aztec's language means artisans or artist. A good way to understand this dynamic is to look at the way the Romans kind of based their artistic and aesthetic tradition on ancient Greece, particularly the Athenian Golden Age and the art and the sculptures and everything that came out of that time. For them, that was their ideal and they did their best to sort of emulate it, but they never quite matched it. The Romans would far surpass the Greeks in their sense of scale and their ability to put together these monumental buildings and works of infrastructure, but they never quite achieved that same level of refinement and detail. And so it would be for the Aztecs who would far surpass the Toltecs in terms of monumental feats of architecture and engineering. But when judging on a purely artistic level, they would not be able to match the Toltecs, at least in the minds of the experts who spend their lives studying this stuff. Beyond them being great artists and them being the dominant civilization around this time period, we don't know much about the Toltecs. Making things murkier, many historians today aren't 100% sure the Toltecs even existed, at least not in anywhere near the form the Aztecs describe. There's a theory gaining converts that suggests the Aztecs might have invented the Toltecs altogether, or maybe they synthesized a few different groups into one all-powerful group. And they did this, according to this theory, to give their own later claims to power and legitimacy more weight. This may sound crazy, but if you think about it, inventing a past is something we've seen many times in ancient European and Middle Eastern history. The early Romans, for example, claimed to be descendants of the Trojans, no way to prove that or disprove it, though it seems very unlikely. 
Alexander the Great thought he was a descendant of Achilles, and so by extension the Macedonians, who were not considered real Greeks by Athenians or Spartans or Corinthians, suddenly had ties to the cities and the kings of the Homeric epics so central to Greek culture when they emerged as the dominant Greeks. We've seen this in religious contexts as well. Followers of Jesus went out of their way in the New Testament to show his family tree going back to King David, for example. This made his followers claims that he was the true Messiah more legitimate, they believed at least, because Jewish tradition held that the Messiah would likely come from the house of David. Hard to know for sure if that family tree is true or not. Arabs believe they are the descendants of Abraham by the way of his first son Ishmael, while the Jews are descended from his second son Isaac. Again, there's no real way to prove or disprove that link, or the Jewish link to Isaac for that matter let alone if Abraham ever existed. No disrespect to my Muslim, Jewish, or Christian listeners, but at this point, it doesn't really matter, does it? These stories have enough truth in them to give them a power all their own and give people a sense of belonging to a greater legacy. Whether it's 100% true or 25% true, it's still very palpable. And so whether the Toltecs really existed or whether there was really a continuity of culture and genealogy and nobility from the Toltecs to the Aztecs, the way the Aztecs tell the story much later, it doesn't really matter either. The Aztecs either believed they existed, or pretended like they existed and went to great lengths to maintain this illusion for any number of reasons, and because those are the only records we really have, and because we know the city of Tula was real and pretty amazing, then we can assume that there was some group of people there who were the dominant civilization between the time that Teotihuacan declined, around 750 AD, and the rise of Aztec civilization around 1200 AD. These people, real or invented or synthesized, the Aztecs called the Toltecs, and that's who they modeled much of their civilization on. That seems like a set of ground rules that was both likely and broadly provable, and the archaeology mostly backs this loose structure up. I said Aztec civilization was the dominant civilization in central Mexico by 1200 AD, but the first wave of Aztec migrations left Aslan and arrived in the Valley of Mexico beginning a little earlier, about 900 AD, as we mentioned. There are a few different versions of the Aslan origin myth that have survived, and they're all a little different. They all tell the story of seven tribes who left Aslan one after the other and made their way south and settled in and around the valley but they can differ quite a bit on what the names of those tribes were and in what order they migrated. By some estimations, there are up to two dozen names associated with these seven tribes, and the order of who came first, who came next, etc. varies, so it can be very confusing. Archaeologists have split them up into three broad waves. The first wave arrived between 900 AD and 1000 AD. They found the Valley of Mexico sparsely populated, just a handful of cities along the shore of the lakes and other scattered villages. And so these Aztecs were able to build relatively secure city-states on good land without too much trouble. The second wave arrived between 1000 AD and 1100 AD and found the good land in the valley mostly taken, and so many of them settled outside the valley to the east and to the south. The last wave came after 1100 AD, and they found the entire area saturated with city-states and just had to do their best to adapt. Among the first of these Aztec groups to arrive during the first wave were the Culhua people, who appeared in the Valley of Mexico right as the Toltec Golden Era would have been at its peak. The Culhua either settled in or built the city of Culhuacan, sometimes spelled and pronounced Colhuacan. I say settled in or built because it's unclear if the Culhua built the city themselves after arriving in the Valley of Mexico, or if actual Toltecs under orders from Tula founded and built the city, and then the Culhua settled there and slowly but surely integrated into Toltec society and took the name Culhua for themselves. However it happened, archaeologists seem certain that the city of Culhuacan was built around 900 AD, which is right around the time the Culhua people arrived. The city was situated near the strategic point where the smaller freshwater lakes in the southern part of the valley drained into the larger, saltier Lake Texcoco to the north. Culhuacan also appears to be the first city to build on and rely on artificial islands for a significant portion of their agriculture, what the Aztecs called chinampas. These were a major innovation. Chinampas would be a crucial part of the infrastructure of later Aztec cities, especially Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital and they'll play an important role in some key battles with the Spanish. 
but the Kulhua seem to be the ones who built them first. The city grew during the twilight of the Toltec era, so it's likely they developed institutions and artistic and religious traditions that were influenced by these Toltec people, again, whoever they were. The city survived whatever ended the Toltec era, unlike Tula itself, which, like Teotihuacan 300 years earlier, completely collapses suddenly and was largely abandoned by 1050 AD. But Culhuacan would remain an important city right on through the final battles with the Spanish and they would maintain a reputation for being the most Toltec city with the most Toltec bloodlines and the strongest Toltec cultural roots. This reverence the later Aztecs had for the Toltecs can't be overstated. It was so ingrained in Aztec society that hundreds of years after the Toltec civilization collapsed, Aztec nobles still went out of their way to link themselves to the Toltec nobility. So you have kings and princes and nobles in Aztec city-states at the time of the conquest, even after, still claiming to be the great-great-great-great-grandson of a Toltec king or a prince. In addition to the Kulhua, the Xochimilco and the Chalco people were two other groups of Aztecs who arrived in this first wave. They most likely came after the Kulhua, but were not certain. The Xochimilco and the Chalco settled on the southern shores of the southern freshwater lakes. Chalco and Xochimilco are also the names of the cities these two groups founded, and the names of the two lakes their cities were situated on, as you may have picked up on during our description of the lake region earlier this episode. It's unclear which was named first, the people, the cities, or the lakes, but the fact that all three bear the same name, I think, has some significance to it. The Tepaneks were another of these early groups to arrive. They settled on the western shore of Lake Texcoco, which again is the largest of the five lakes and the most central. The Tepaneks would eventually establish two great cities, Azcapotzalco and Tlacopan, and both cities will feature prominently later in the story. The Tepanex emerged as the most powerful of these first-wave Nahuatl-speaking groups and would go on to build what some historians now consider to be an empire by around 1300 AD, meaning they ruled over most of the other cities in the Valley of Mexico to some degree, but also expanded their influence beyond the valley and ruled over non-Nahuatl-speaking people further out. In the process, they created early versions of many of the economic, diplomatic, and other institutions employed to rule that empire that later Aztecs would build on and use to great effectiveness. The Akolhua people arrived during the early part of the second wave, sometime after 1100 AD in all likelihood. They settled on the eastern shore of Lake Texcoco and named their city, surprise, surprise, Texcoco. Again, we're not sure which came first, the city name or the lake name, But interestingly here, the Akolhua kept the Akolhua name and didn't adapt it to either the city or the lake, as other Aztecs had. The Akolhua would rise to rival the Tepaneks, and they produced what many consider to be the first great Aztec king, who we'll meet shortly. And Akolhua people in the city of Texcoco would remain important players during the clash with the Spanish. As we mentioned, these lakes have all since been drained or dried up, and modern Mexico City has been built literally on top of them. But there are a couple of places where there's still an appreciable amount of water above the surface, and one of those places is Xochimilco. In fact, you can visit ancient Xochimilco today, sort of. It's now a large neighborhood in southern Mexico City, so most of it is modern streets and buildings, and it's densely populated like the rest of the city. But right in the heart of this modern neighborhood, a little corner of the ancient city survives. There are no real ruins, but you can rent a party boat and cruise through a small section of the network of canals and man-made islands that once constituted the ancient city of Xochimilco. So when you take your bucket list trip to go see Teotihuacan, it's a great way to unwind toward the end of that trip before you come back home. One more note on the city of Culhuacan and their citizens. As we mentioned, they had the strongest and probably the only real links to the Toltec era or to Toltec people, and they were the most deliberate and successful at positioning themselves as the true inheritors of Toltec culture and genealogy. Kulhua nobles were considered among the most prestigious all the way up until the very end of the Aztec period, and even after the conquest you still have Kulhua nobles trying to stand out in the new Spanish-dominated era. Again, no real way to prove this, but we know that even when other groups were in charge of the Aztec world, the Kulhua were still considered the most prestigious and elite of the nobility, even though they had long ceded any real political power to other groups. Think of them like the European nobility today. 
There are much richer and more powerful people around the world, in America, in Asia, in the Middle East, in India, etc. And European noble and even royal families don't wield any real political power in any modern European country today. Their formal roles, when they do have them, are largely ceremonial and their wealth limited to real estate and already amassed fortunes. But there's still a lot of prestige if you can marry into one of those families, right? Lots of land, lots of wealth, but not a whole lot of power, not a whole lot of influence on the affairs of the day. That was the Kulhua in the late Aztec period, and to a lesser degree the Akolhua who rose later. All the way up until the time of the Spanish arrival, they sort of maintained that level of prestige. They were the old money, as we would say today. The new money of Aztec society by the time the Spanish arrive were the Mexica. They were the last of these nomadic groups to migrate out of Aslan and into the Valley of Mexico, again, according to this tradition. That name, I'm sure, rings a bell with many of you. Mexica is, of course, where the name Mexico comes from, because these were the Aztecs that had wrested control of central Mexico by the time Columbus first reaches the Caribbean. They took what the Culhua were able to salvage from the Toltec era, and what the Tepanecs built on top of that, and what the Acolhua later enhanced, and they expanded all of that into a civilization larger and more militarily powerful and more influential and wealthy than anything the New World had ever seen. We're dedicating episode two entirely to the Mexica because they are the most important players in this story, and their rise to dominance is a fascinating mix of history and legend and conquest and diplomacy and everything you look for as a history buff. The Machica and the rest of the Aztecs are, of course, the lead characters in the story along with the Spanish, but they were surrounded by secondary characters that we're going to spend the rest of this episode meeting. Mexico was thoroughly populated when the Spanish arrived in the New World. Small cities and villages dotted the landscape from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico and from well north of Mexico City down to Central America. The most populous of these other non-Aztec groups were the Mayans, who were situated to the east of the Aztec heartland in and around the Yucatan Peninsula. At the time the Aztecs were reaching their zenith, the Mayan people are centuries removed from their golden age when they built massive cities with pyramids and palaces and observatories and they developed advanced mathematics and astronomy and civil engineering feats. And they're going through a period not unlike the European Dark Ages around the same time. Those once great cities are in advanced states of decay or even abandoned in many cases. Dozens of petty chiefs and warlords rule over small kingdoms, their armies little more than roving bands of raiders. Even their language has fragmented to the point where Mayans on one side of the Yucatan Peninsula would have had trouble communicating with Mayans on the other side of the Yucatan Peninsula. Again, not unlike the way Latin slowly split into Italian and Spanish and French after the fall of the Roman Empire, depending on where you lived. But their culture endured. Trade between these cities limped on. Ancient Mayan religious practices and holidays and pilgrimages continued. And there was still a distinct and vibrant Mayan civilization that was alive at this time, from the Yucatan Peninsula in the east and the north, to modern-day Guatemala in the south, to what is now the Mexican state of Tabasco in the southwest. Now, the Mayans and the Aztecs don't exactly border each other, The maps of pre-Columbian Mexico always seem to color the Yucatan and the southeastern parts of the country one color, denoting the Mayan world. And then central Mexico is another color, showing what area the Aztecs controlled. And those colors always butt up against each other and make it seem like there was this border crossing where everything changed. Well, it wasn't nearly that clean of a division. The heartlands of each civilization were six, seven, eight hundred miles apart. And what you have in between the Mayan and Aztec heartlands is more of a cultural spectrum that shifts gradually between the two. You have people just outside the Aztec heartland, for example, in, say, Veracruz, like the Totonacs, who we'll meet later in the story, or the Huastecs. These were distinct, separate civilizations with their own unique histories, but they were integrated into the Aztec world by about 1500, And they spoke Nahuatl, often as a second language, but more and more as a first language as time went on. Then you have cities on the periphery of the Mayan heartland like Pontonchan, which will feature in an important episode later in the story. In Pontonchan, they spoke a Mayan dialect and worshipped Mayan gods and were more integrated into the Mayan economy. But because they were so far west, they interacted with Aztec merchants and even had to deal with Aztec incursions by their armies looking to expand their empire. And in between these two regions, you have dozens of cities and villages where it isn't so clear which culture is dominant. 
or where their loyalties lied. Making things more complicated, those loyalties would often shift back and forth over time. What's clear is that the Aztec civilization is ascendant after about 1200 AD, and the Mayans are in advanced decline with no signs of returning to its previous glory. The Aztecs expanded with their military, but also with their merchants and their artisans and their agriculture and engineering mastery, what we'd call soft power today. Farmers and artisans in these smaller towns and cities on the periphery realized that they could get a lot richer if they traded with Aztec merchants. And to do that more effectively, they would start learning Nahuatl, and soon more of these cities that were maybe more Mayan on the cultural spectrum for hundreds of years are becoming more and more Aztec. So you have the Mayan world over here in the east and southeast, and then you have that cultural spectrum between the Mayan and Aztec heartlands where things become more Aztec the closer to the Valley of Mexico you get. To the west of the Aztec heartland, you have a completely different dynamic with a people called the Tarascans, also called the Purépechas. We know very little about the Tarascans at this time, other than they were formidable enemies of the Aztecs and were never conquered by them. Aztec armies conquered just about everyone they encountered, and so when they're checked, it's pretty noteworthy. The Tarascans were not Nahua speakers, as they came from a completely different linguistic group, and they weren't from Aslan like the others. Their language is still spoken today, in fact, by about 100,000 or so Purépecha descendants in the modern state of Michoacán. Some historians and archaeologists now classify the Tarascan civilization as an empire, and so they may have been more significant rivals to the Aztecs than is widely understood. They controlled a large portion of Mexico from the frontier of the Aztec world to their east, all the way to the Pacific Ocean in the west, encompassing much of the modern-day states of Michoacán and Jalisco. And there's a massive temple complex that's magnificently preserved in the city of Tzintzuntzan, which was the Tarascan capital, which, once again, like many of the other sites we mentioned already, and to be mentioned throughout this pod, you can still see it and walk through it today. Surprisingly, or perhaps not, the Aztec records and oral histories are oddly silent about the Tarascans, and they seem not to have been a factor in the Aztec clash with the Spanish one way or the other, though they would later have their own encounter with the Spanish, and as you might imagine, it did not go well for them either. To the north of the Tarascans, you have smaller groups like the Cora and the Huichol, These people still exist as well in much smaller numbers, but their languages are still spoken and maintained. Further south of that, you have groups like the Zapotecs and the Mixtecs in and around the modern-day state of Oaxaca. These people had been in Oaxaca long before the Aztecs rise. In fact, the Zapotecs are credited with developing one of the first true cities in all of Mesoamerica. The Olmecs were the first, perhaps as far back as 1400 B.C., That's about the time the Mycenaean civilization in Greece was nearing its peak, a couple hundred years before the Trojan Wars, just for perspective. But not long after the Olmecs and independently of them, the Zapotecs built a marvelous civilization in the heart of the Oaxaca Valley with the city of Montalban as their crowning achievement. By the time the Aztecs incorporated them into their empire in the 15th century, they had been a distinct civilization for over a thousand years. So lots going on in central Mexico at this time. And yes, the Zapotecs are still there too. Their language and their cuisine and other traditions wonderfully preserved, as are the ruins of Montalban. There's also a group the Aztecs and others call the Chichimex, or the Chichimeca. They've always been a bit of a mystery, although they appear everywhere in the Aztec oral histories, and they're featured in a few pictographic codices that have survived as well. Historians have long treated them as another one of these distinct ethnic nomadic groups from the north, though it's unclear if they were Aztecs by the working definition of that term as we outlined, meaning it's not 100% clear that they were one of the mythical seven tribes from Aslan. Analysis of some surviving pictographic codices tell of a legendary Chichimec ruler named Cholot founding the city of Tenayuca on the western shore of Lake Texcoco, The date for the city's founding in this version is 1224, after the Toltec civilization centered on Tula further north would have collapsed. These same codices name a series of Xolot's successors who expanded Chichimec influence before they succumbed to, or perhaps allied with, the Akolhua people over in Texcoco on the eastern shore of the lake. That's how the Aztecs tell the story of the Chichimec anyway. The problem with this story, however, is that the archaeological record doesn't back this up, not even a little bit. 
There are stunning ruins of ancient Tenayuca, and tons of archaeological work has been done there. And it's pretty clear the city is much older than the date King Cholot was supposed to have founded the city for the Chichimex. When the Kulhua and the other early Aztec migrants began arriving in the region in the first wave after 900 AD, it's likely the Chichimex had already been in Tenayuca for some time and were some sort of vassal state of the Toltecs. Once Toltec rule collapsed and the city of Tula with it after 1050 AD, Tenayuca and its inhabitants, whoever they were, seemed to have been the first to fill the power vacuum left in the Valley of Mexico and began asserting some degree of authority over the first wave of Aztecs as they settled and built their cities around the lakes, enough to make these early Aztecs detest them and strive to overtake them culturally and economically, which they soon did. Tenayuca's days as the top dog in the Valley of Mexico lasted only a few decades at most, and they don't seem to have left much of a lasting cultural impact either. By 1300 AD, these Chichimex had been thoroughly Aztecized, if that's a word, and their city incorporated into the emerging Aztec world, likely through some kind of merger with the Acolhua. This is the best interpretation, in my estimation, of the Aztec version of the story of the Chichimex once all the archaeology is factored in. But even this Occam's razor description has a problem. There are other groups of people around the Valley of Mexico that are referred to as Chichimex by different sources. We also know that the Machica, who were the last of the Aslan migrants to arrive in the valley, claimed a connection to the Chichimex of some kind. But that's not possible if the Chichimex were already there when the first wave of Aztecs arrived, nor is it possible if these same Chichimex had dissolved into the larger Aztec society by the time we know the Machica arrived. To complicate matters further, Spanish conquistadors who came after Cortes and went north looking for conquests of their own report of fighting people they called the Chichimex decades after defeating the Aztecs. All of this can't be true, obviously, and so instead of trying to figure out who the Chichimex really were, historians are now considering the possibility that Chichimex was the word the more civilized Aztecs used for the untold number of nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes that roamed the north-central parts of Mexico, living off the land, raiding cities when necessary, always on the move. In this context, the word takes on a meaning similar to the word the Greeks and later the Romans used to describe anyone they considered uncivilized, barbarians. This also meant that your group could have started out as Chichimex in the eyes of the more civilized Nahua speakers, but once your people settled in an area and started building a city and farming, you'd no longer be Chichimex, you'd be called something else. Again, not unheard of in other parts of the world, but there's one more group we need to talk about, and they're the most controversial group in this whole story. The role they played in the events of the conquest, again, air quotes, is often glossed over by historians even to this day. And depending on how you want to look at what they did, they were either savvy, heroic underdogs who took advantage of an opportunity to take revenge on their longtime oppressors by siding with an enemy with superior weapons and tactics, or they're among the greatest traitors in the history of the world who unwittingly, perhaps, paved the way for one of the greatest genocides in human history and the many evils that came in its aftermath. Because, folks, there's no other way to say it. Without the armies of this group of people, Cortes would have failed and the history of the Western Hemisphere would have likely been very different. And these people were, of course, the Tlaxcalan. To me, this has always been the most tragic part of this story because the people from the city-state of Tlaxcala were culturally and ethnically Aztec. They spoke Nahuatl just like the others, they worshipped the same pantheon of gods, performed similar religious practices and rituals and festivals. They were also one of the seven groups that migrated from Aslan into central Mexico, probably part of that second wave we talked about. They initially settled inside the Valley of Mexico on land east of Texcoco, well off the lake, but the Acolhua, who had gotten there earlier, drove them out. So they decided to go a little further east to a smaller valley, only about a three-hour drive today, but maybe a week or more by foot at that time. The valley they chose is both fertile and very defensible, and perhaps this, combined with their, shall we say, bad experience with the other Aztecs in the Valley of Mexico, gave the Tlaxcala a bit of an independent streak, as we call it today. They remained detached and isolated from the politics and the trade going on over in the lake region for most of their history. When the Machica rose to power and started to expand the borders of what would become the Aztec Empire, the Tlaxcalan wanted no part of it. They had their own thing going on, 
They eventually built three cities in and around their own little valley with all the agriculture and mining and other industries to support them. They became a highly militarized state, able to field huge, well-equipped armies, large enough to check or even deter the Aztec armies. But they also appear to have functioned a lot like a republic. They had a king, but there was also a council of a couple hundred officials that wielded some degree of influence. And even more shocking, non-nobles were part of this council too, usually appointed for heroic feats in battle. This suggests something like a meritocracy was emerging, which would have distinguished it politically but also culturally from the much more traditional absolute monarchies over in the Valley of Mexico. Not unlike the way the Athenian democracy created political and cultural divisions with Sparta and the other Greek city-states and helped fuel a testy rivalry that erupted in periodic wars, even though they were so similar in nearly every other way. While the Tlaxcala weren't all that interested in integrating into the expanding Aztec empire in any way, the Machica wouldn't take no for an answer. They tried multiple times to conquer the Tlaxcalans by force, but they eventually gave up and decided it would be better to just isolate them and then continue conquering people beyond and around Tlaxcala territory. And so if you look at maps of Aztec expansion after 1400, the area under their control extends east from the lake region all the way to the Gulf Coast and northeast to incorporate the Huastecs and the Otomis and southeast to incorporate the Totonacs and other peoples in modern-day Veracruz. But there's always a spot of land the size of a large American county that's excluded from the Aztec area of control. That's Tlaxcala. And the end result is that the Tlaxcalan Valley would be completely surrounded by the Aztecs for decades. Think of it like West Berlin completely surrounded by East Germany from 1945 until the fall of the Berlin Wall. A lot more to say about the Tlaxcalans, obviously, but we know a lot about them. Nearly as much as we do about the Mexica because, well, they picked the winning side. And so not only do Spanish sources speak very highly of them and thoroughly about them, the Tlaxcalan people still exist today, and they've been able to tell their own history. Unlike most of the other groups we mentioned that were around before the Spanish arrived, the Tlaxcalan don't exist off in some reservation or on some mountain range somewhere. The Spaniards sort of left them alone after the conquest. They asked them to convert to Catholicism and learn Spanish, or force them to is probably more accurate. And then they treated them more or less like a vassal state in the decades following the conquest. And today, Tlaxcala is one of Mexico's 32 states, and their state boundaries roughly correspond with the territory they controlled before the conquest. And they're just normal-looking and acting Mexicans, indistinguishable from other Mexicans in other states and regions, but ones who maintain a certain degree of pride about their unique role in Mexican history. But it's a fascinating and almost Shakespearean element to this story, and it speaks to how powerful Mexico's identity is today as a mestizo nation. They are not Spain in some places and Indian in other places. They have, to an extraordinary degree, combined their parent civilizations into something entirely new. Something like this has happened in virtually every other Latin American country as well. But Mexico, more than most of the others, has gone out of its way to celebrate its pre-Columbian heritage and even give it primacy over the obvious and overwhelming influence of Spanish culture and heritage when formulating its own national identity, at least on paper. In practice, of course, the story is very different. Mexico still has a lot of problems with racism and poverty, and most of the people in power and with money are lighter-skinned and more European-looking, while most of the poorer people are darker-skinned and more native-looking. All of that speaks to a very blatant preference for a European ideal historically and a suppression of all things not European, and I don't want to gloss over any of that. But acknowledging and elevating their native roots as they've done since at least the end of the Mexican Revolution around 1930, but in many ways before, is unique and it's commendable. And across Latin America, with few exceptions, it's this mix, this mestizaje as it's called in Spanish, of European, Native American, and African people and cultures that make Latinos a distinct people in the modern world. And while the process of becoming a mestizaje was, and perhaps still is, tragic in far too many cases and instances, it nonetheless happened and continues to happen. And all of those ingredients that we can look back on and see how distinct and unique they all were in the past have now all been baked into something new over 500 years and you can't go back and re-separate those things. And nobody really talks about doing that either. That's a common metaphor across Latin America today that they use to describe the difference between them and the United States. 
They say the United States is like a salad, where all the ingredients are jumbled together into something more or less harmonious most of the time, or at least functional, but where you can still separate the lettuce and the tomatoes and the croutons and the cucumbers, and many might even prefer it that way. Latin America, on the other hand, is more like a cake. It has just as many ingredients, flour, sugar, milk, eggs, etc., but it's all been baked into something completely new, and you couldn't separate the ingredients even if you wanted to. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's not wrong. And this baking process began with Cortez and Moctezuma. So that's the lay of the land in Mexico on the eve of this epic story. We're going to go deeper into the origins and the rise of the Mexica in our next episode and explain how this unlikely group of nomads came to dominate the other Aztecs, and then all of central Mexico. Episode 2 will be out soon.